Good evening, directors. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, November 18th, Board of Directors meeting for Dr. Cog. I will call to order the meeting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, next item, roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Uh, we have no introduction of new members and alternates, so I will turn over to Ms. Stevens for roll call, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, all right, I opened up the lines for uh, directors, you can unmute yourself to speak. Uh, and any directors on the phones, please hit star six to unmute yourself. All right, and here we go. Ava Henry. Evo Dericio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Deb Gardner. Here. Elise Jones. Oh, thank here. you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, William Linstead. Here. William's here. Thank you. Randy Wheelock. George Martin. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Here. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott, Mike Kaufman, here. David Spellman, Larry Vidum, here. Aaron Brockett, present, Margo Ramson, Adam Cushing, present. Deborah Mulvey. Present. George Teal. Jason Gray. Tammy Mauer. Present. Roy Palmer. Jeremy Tay. Randy Wheel. Russell Stewart. Nicole Frank. Okay, thank you. Catherine Whitman. Jackie Thomas. Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Cheryl Wink. Cheryl here. Wink. Yeah, here. Oh, okay. Uh, Bill Gipp. Okay, Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, John Poniak, David Whelan, uh, and I do see uh, for the record that Bill is in attendance, so thank you, Bill. Uh, Josie Cockrell, Lynette Kelsey, here. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, Rachel Binkley. Ryan Tushier. Jim Paul Hassman. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Hello. Tim Barnes. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> uh, Jake. Karina Elrod. Here. Larry Strock. Present. Wynn Shaw. Present. Joan Peck. Present. Ashley Solzman. Oh, thank you, Joan. Ashley Solzman. Here. Nicholas Angelo. Holly Rogen. Colleen Whitlow. David Adams. 
<clears throat> Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Christopher Larson, Julie Duran Mullica, Joyce Downing, Sally Daigle, Dave Black. Sally's here. Oh, thank you, Sally. Clint Folsom. Jessica Sandgren. Julie Martin. Herb Atchison. Yes. Bud Starker. Rebecca White. Adam Zarin. Bill Van Meter. Here. Thank you. Okay, and if there's anyone uh, that wasn't able to unmute themselves before, is there anyone that wants to state their name for the record? Directors? Bob Piper's joined. Anyone on the phone? Oh, there we go. Thank did you, you Bob. Bob? Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you. Jim Dale. Margo, Margo Ramsden from Beaumont. <laughs> All right, thank you. Catherine. Sorry, Ken Whit from Toronto. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I will hand it back to the chair with a quorum. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, the next item is a approval of the agenda. If there is somebody who would like to make a motion to approve the agenda, please raise your raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have anyone? Uh, yes, our first hand that was up was uh, Catherine Whitman. So, Director Whitman, you can unmute yourself and make the motion. I will make a motion to accept the agenda as presented. Thank you very much. Second. Uh, all right, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Stevens, please open the phone line so we can have our first vote of the night. All right, uh, directors should be able to unmute themselves at this time. All right, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against, Same. motion carries. We have an agenda. Thank you, everyone. Isn't this uh, fun? We will close the phone lines and move on to the next uh, the next item. Report of the chair. Um, I have nothing to report at this time. I will uh, move on to report on performance and engagement committee director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, performance and engagement committee did not meet. Uh, this month, so there is no report. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, report on Finance and Budget Committee. Uh, Director Conklin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had two action items tonight. We approved a resolution authorizing the Executive Director to enter into an agreement with the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, for approximately $2 million for the period of October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2021. Parts of that had already been approved, but tonight was really some house cleaning to, to get the, the full uh, resolution approved. And we also approved a resolution authorizing the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Cactus Incorporated to provide professional advertising and promotional services for way to go so way to go has a new advertising agency after six years with their prior agency uh, and that contract will be uh, negotiated for an amount not to exceed eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars going through december 31st of 2021 and that's my report thank you very much director conklin uh, the next item report of the executive director executive director rex please Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a very short report this evening on three items. The first was on, on Medicare open enrollment, which began in October 15th and runs through December 7th. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but um, we operate as um, uh, as as the the state health insurance assistance providers for several several counties within our region. 
And um, also, I'm not sure if anybody realizes this either, there are 57 Medicare Advantage programs to choose from through, um, with, within the state. And we know that can be a very confusing landscape for anyone that's trying to pick a plan. Um, so we would, you know, quite frankly, Dr. Cog's staff, you know, the professionals that we have, we have certified counselors in this area. So if you have constituents that are reaching out to you or had conversations with you about Medicare, um, please um, forward them to, to us. You can, you can reach some of the appropriate individuals through our website. We have um, on our Dr. Cog website, we have a page set up for, for the SHIP program or state health insurance assistance providers, and we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Um, also, uh, earlier, well, at the end of October, we, we uh, completed our, um, our largest employer campaign called GoTober, and it's largely an employer challenge that encourages people to ditch their single occupancy vehicles for other ways to get around. Of course, in today's environment, many of us are still predominantly working uh, via, via telework, um, but we, we saw uh, people tracking trips of all kinds, including uh, transit, biking, and carpooling. And we, Truly do want to recognize the winners, um, the organizations that won. We have uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, uh, Denver Water was a winner, uh, Native Roots, and Rocky Mountain Institute were our, our four winners this year. So congratulations to all of them. Um, the last item I had is, um, is related to a Front Range Waste Diversion Grant that we applied for a couple months ago, and I had mentioned that to the board in a, in a previous executive director's report. Um, we, you know, the, we, we did a grant to uh, support waste diversion planning, and then that's a concept of divert, diverting waste from landfills and building regional infrastructure to support local recycling and com composting um, efforts. Unfortunately, we were not successful in securing uh, the uh, grant during that initial round from the state. Um, however, we do plan on continuing our coordination efforts with a dozen or so member governments that spearheaded the process to develop the region's uh, project proposal. While we weren't successful, there were several of our members that secured funding as part of this grant um, effort uh, to advance local priorities and programs. So special congratulations to the um, to Arvada, Broomfield, and Erie uh, on their recent awards. Um, we look forward to learning from from all your innovative approaches and programs um, as we go forth with this this uh, very very important conversation. Lastly, I wanted to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving and a safe Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, it's crazy times out there right now, so please be careful. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again next month. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Director Ricks. We appreciate the update. Uh, next item, public comment. Up to 45 minutes allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, Time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Um, if there is public comment, please feel free to raise, raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, is there any public comment at this point in time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, First, if there's anyone on the phones, please hit star six and you can start speaking now. Okay, I don't hear anyone on the phones and I am not seeing any hands raised, so I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll close public comment at 644. Uh, the next section of the agenda is the consent agenda, item seven. Uh, I will need, uh, we have a, a one item on the consent agenda. Uh, I am looking for uh, questions, comments, or a motion. Uh, if there is someone who would like to provide a motion, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, is there anyone who would entertain a motion or provide a motion for me? Uh, yes, uh, the first hand that went up was uh, Director Atchison. You may unmute yourself and make a motion. Move to accept the consent agenda. Thank you, Director Atchison. Uh, is there a second, Ms. Stevens? Just looking for, oh, there we go. Uh, it looks like our second comes from Director Peck. So Director Peck, go ahead and unmute yourself and second. A second. Uh, she might, oh, right. there we go. Thank you, Director Peck. Um, all right, we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Ms. Stevens, please open the phone lines so we can vote. All right, they're open. 
All right. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Uh, the next section is uh, action items. Uh, item eight, select representative to the, to the nominating committee. Uh, Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Let me get my paper here. Um, so each year, uh, according to our articles, we're, articles, we're responsible for um, seating a nominating committee to present to the board the nominations for the executive committee for the upcoming year. Um, the articles further indicates, you know, the you know how those uh, nominating committee members are chosen or appointed. Um, and it's uh, first, it's the immediate past chair of the board, which is uh, Director Pfeiffer. Uh, we uh, the one board member uh, representing the city county of Denver will serve on the nominating committee and a member from each that performs an engagement committee and the finance and budget committee. And Melinda, I might need your help because I, I I can't remember who it's, I saw, I, I know it's uh, Director Brockett from performance and engagement and I believe it was Director Dale from finance and budget. That's correct. That's correct, yeah, okay, good. Um, and so we have two more seats we have to fill. One is a member selected from the board at large, and uh, then the board chair also gets to appoint a member. So this evening, you know, we're, we're asking for anybody who might be interested in serving on the nominating committee. Again, their primary role is to um, bring forth to the board a, the nominations for the executive committee um, for the upcoming year. But just a couple things to remember with regards to, you know, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> just figuring out if this is something you might be interested in is that nominating committee members are not eligible to hold a seat on the executive committee for for the year in which you're serving on the on the nominating committee um, you must have served on the board for at least a year to be eligible to serve on the nominating committee and um, uh, a designated alternate may not serve uh, on the nominating committee it must actually must be the primary board member so with that said, Mr. Chairman, I will just uh, throw it back to you and see if there's um, someone out there that would be willing to serve on a nominating committee. We appreciate it. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. And uh, as uh, as Executive Director Rex indicated, uh, I I do have a uh, I guess an appointment. I, I am happy to uh, to include that in this process. If there are two people uh, that we can come to that would um, that would entertain doing uh, the nominating committee, I am happy to to select or appoint uh, that that second person. Uh, if we get to a situation where we have to vote, uh, again, the uh, top two uh, would would advance to the nominating committee. So with with that, um, directors, uh, if there is anybody who would who would like to um, serve on the nominating committee, please raise your virtual hand or press star six. Ms. Stevens. All right, thank you. I'm just running through the list and waiting to see a hand go up. Okay, it looks like we have a hand raised from Director Atchison. Director Atchison. Yes, ma'am. Director Atchison, thank you very much for, uh, for volunteering. Uh, do we have a second uh, person who would like to volunteer for the nominating committee? Okay, just waiting to see if any other hands go up. <laughs> People are being bashful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think they want to serve with you, Herb. That's the issue. <laughs> you might want to because they might get my vote. <laughs> I, can, I can go through the list. Can we just pick somebody? No, Bob, you can't pick anybody. So we just randomly grab a name <laughs> off this list and say, you're it. You're volunteering. This is Sally. My oh. hand is up. Sally. Oh, yep, Sally. All right. Director and Dale. Chicken. Thank what you am I doing? Much. Why am I volunteering myself? Because <laughs> we need you. <laughs> oh, sure. All right. Um, okay. So with. I'll serve with Herb anytime. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Executive Director Rex, do we need a motion for this, or 
the, the selection is complete when when we have two people. A motion would be good, especially for for the member at large one. All right. So I, so I would. Yep. With uh, with um, Director Atchison and Director Daigle uh, volunteering for the nominating committee, uh, if there's anybody out there that would like to entertain uh, or present the motion, um, please please raise your virtual hand or press star six. Uh, I did see Director Flynn. Uh, Director Flynn, would you like to make that motion? Uh, yes, thank you. Mr. Chair, what would the motion be that the board uh, select uh, Director Atchison as its appointee, and that then would leave you to uh, appoint uh, uh, Director Daigle? Um, I will I will accept that, and I will appoint uh, Director okay. Daigle after this, this motion. Thank you very much. Okay, then, uh, then I move that the board of directors appoint uh, Director Herb Atchison to the nominating committee. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All right, Director Pfeiffer. Okay, Ms. Stevens, it, it sounds like we have the, the lines open. So um, all those in favor, please signify. Aye. 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 Against? Yes. Director <laughs> Ashton, abstain? All right, uh, motion carries. Um, and um, I, uh, I, the chair, will appoint uh, Director Daigle as the as the final member of the nominating committee. Thank you, everyone. Um, the, next, the next item is uh, select representatives to serve on the RTC stack E470 and the ACA. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And that went so swimmingly. I'm sure this one is really going to go go well um well first of all i just want to thank every director that expressed interest to serve on one of the four committees that we're going to be discussing this evening um for two of the committees the aca or the advisory committee on aging and the e470 board um we have interest from the the requisite number of directors so there isn't a need for a ballot runoff for, for those two committees so the members as proposed are for the advisory committee on aging we have three openings and they they would be filled um, ultimately by a, it would require a vote of the board, uh, directors Dale, Shaw, and Peck. And then for E470, Chair Dyack has indicated that he would serve as the member. However, we do need an alternate in the event that uh, Chair Dyack can't, uh, can't attend. Um, so uh, Chair Dyack, I would just ask maybe at this time that if, we, uh, if there's anybody out there that might be interested. Yes, uh, thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, the only person I am uh, I am thinking of, uh, not to put you on the spot, Director Sangren, but you are uh, you are also a voting member. Um, would you be willing to uh, serve as the alternate in the event of my absence? Sure, I can do that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Great, Executive Director Rex. Back Thanks to you. Thanks so very much. Yeah. Now, so for the other two committees. Um, we did receive more interest than we have positions, so it will require a ballot runoff. So in normal years, as, as those have been on the board for a while, we would simply hand out some paper ballots. But as you know, 2020 just keeps on giving and we have to do the ballot contest virtually. So uh, bear with us. It might be a little clumsy, but I think we got a, a process in place that's, that's, that's going to work. Um, so this is what we're going to do. So first, only board members and alternates that are sitting at the table tonight um, for the primary member are eligible to vote. OK, um, for each committee, you can vote for up to two board members to fill the committee seats. Um, we are going to use the virtual hand feature and you will cast your vote sequentially for individual members. Don't worry, I will, we'll provide an example here in a minute, kind of explain that, or at least I will. Um, if we do have board members or um, designated alternates that are joining us by phone this evening, um, please text your vote uh, to my mobile number. And I'll give this a couple times, but uh, first, this mobile number is, if you don't know it, you should. <laughs> I hope you have it in your phone, phone directory. It is 720-545-7717. Again, that's 720-545-7717. 7717. All right, so like I said, we're going to, you know, for everybody else, we're going to be using the virtual hand option. 
Um, so let's just run through a, a quick example. Um, Melinda, can you put, here we go. Okay, this is great. So for example, so this is for the RTC and this is where we, where we will start. So for the RTC, we have um, three candidates that are interested in, the, in this, in, in serving on, in two positions. We have the um, two member, RTC member positions available. Um, so what we'll do is, um, um, like, we'll, we'll ask you to vote for two of three candidates, but we will take them in order. So for example, um, you will be asked if you wish to vote for, uh, so the first name on top is, is uh, Director Mulvey, please raise your hand. Please raise your uh, virtual hand. And that, yes, sir. Uh, yep. Before you go into voting, yep. I have a procedural question for you. Yes, sir. Do members serve on more than one committee? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're not we're not doing the voting yet, um, no, no, but I just wanted to run. My yes, question, no. Yeah, out of the four committees, can one person serve on more than one? Yes, they can. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, um, so yeah. So, so in this example, um, you would be first asked uh, if you wish to vote for Director Mulvey, and please raise your virtual hand now. And then what would happen? Melinda will will give some time, you know, 30 seconds or so for you to raise your hands, and then she will do a screen capture of your of the votes of the raised hands, and then she'll verify and tally the votes, you know, after this is all done, and then come back and report. Um, and then we would take the next person in line, which is um, which is Director Peck, and we would do the same thing over again. We would ask you if you wish to vote for Director Peck, raise your virtual hand now, and so on. Um, so just a couple other things before we start the voting. These, the votes that you're casting, casting are I'm doing virtual quotes here, almost secret. Um, only <laughs> Melinda will only Melinda will see who voted. So everybody else, um, you know, will not see that. Just the organizer of the meeting, which is Melinda. Um, and and again, I'll just remind you guys that you can um, vote for up to two candidates for each committee. And then we'll tally them all up and Melinda will we'll report out a little bit later. So, Mr. Chairman, how about we give it a go? All right. Uh, point of privilege, point oh, of privilege yep. Dale. Could we have a report of what uh, jurisdiction each uh, represents yes, sir. for those who don't remember? Yes, sir. Happy to do so. So, um, for the RTC committee, the three candidates that <laughs> that have expressed interest um, is one is director Deborah Mulvey and she's a council member with the city of Castle Pines. Um, director Joan Peck, council member uh, of Longmont and director Wynn Shaw is a council member with the uh, city of Lone Tree. All right, so um, a lot of brain cells have, have been into trying to, to figure this out and uh, Please, please bear with us. But um, Ms. Stevens, would you like to um, um, highlight uh, Director Mulvey's name so we can start? Okay, so for all of those who would like to vote for Director Mulvey, please use the raise hand button or text Executive Director Rex. I will give you 30 seconds to, to do so. And Ms. Stevens will then screen capture uh, the results and we'll move on to the next person, Director Peck. So this time, Director Mulvey, anybody who would like to vote for her, please do so. And as you're doing that, I'll just state my phone number again. It's 720-545-7717. And just a reminder, you can vote for two of the three as we go forward. And Melinda, when you're ready, um, you know, after we close the, the polling for, for Director Mulvey, you might just let John know when you're ready to move forward. So um, we, will, we will close the polling. Ms. Stevens, please, um, please capture those screenshots and let me know when it is complete. All right, I will do that.
Okay, I am done. All right, uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next candidate, uh, Director Peck from Longmont. For those of you who would like to vote for Director Peck, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director Rex. Uh, again, you can vote for two people out of the three. All right, uh, we have 30 seconds, so I will then close the polling. Ms. Stevens, please take your, your screenshots. Okay, we're good. All right, and the last candidate uh, for the RTC is Director Shaw from Lone Tree. For those of you who would like to vote for Director Shaw, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director X. Again, you can vote for up to two people in this category. All right, 30 seconds has elapsed. I will close polling. Ms. Stevens, please take your screenshots and let me know when you're complete. Okay, one moment. Okay, I think we're good. Very, very well, thank you so much. Um, the next uh, the next vote is for the stack. Um, Executive Director X, do you have any uh, preamble before we get into it, or let's just go for it? Well, I, I'll, I'll just mention this that um, you know. So what you're voting on today, and again, you can vote for uh, up to two candidates. Um, you'll be voting for the member and the alternate to the. State Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, generally, the uh, the first place person gets uh, becomes the member. The second place has the option to become the alternate. Correct. With that, um, Ms. Stevens, are are we ready? Uh, point I'm of privilege, ready. Jen. Yes, uh, sir. Mr. Chair. Director. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Director Dale. I forgot. Um, so. Uh, uh, Ma Director Ashley Stolzman, um, Mayor Louisville, uh, Director Jessica Sangren, uh, Council Member Thornton, uh, Nicholas Williams, City County in De of Denver, and uh, Director Tammy Maurer, Council Member uh, with uh, Centennial. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Stevens? Um, I think we're ready uh, to do hand raises when you're ready. All right. Um, and advance the slide, Melinda. There you go. The uh, uh, the first candidate is uh, Vice Chair Stolzman. Uh, if you would like to vote for Vice Chair Stolzman, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director Rex. Again, you can vote for up to two people. And I'll get my phone number one last time, 720-545-7717. Thank you. And you're willing to text, just say hi, too. All right, the 30 seconds have 
have passed. So I will close voting for Vice Chair Stoltzman. Ms. Stevens, please take your screenshots and let me know when you are complete. Okay. Okay, we're right. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next candidate, um, Director Sangren from Thornton. Um, if if you would like to uh, vote for Director Sangren uh, from Thornton, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director Rex. And again, uh, up to two uh, votes per uh, voting member. All right, I will close close polling for uh, for Director Sangren. Uh, Ms. Stevens, please take your screenshots and let me know when you're complete. Okay, we're ready. All right, uh, the next candidate, Director Williams from Denver. For those of you who would like to, uh, to vote for Director Williams, uh, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director Rex. Again, you can vote up to two uh, members in, in this category. All right, I will close polling for uh, Director Williams. Uh, Ms. Stevens, please complete your screenshots and let me know. I didn't know if you heard me. Uh, I am done with my screenshotting for this one. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the the next and last candidate is Director Maurer from Centennial. For those of you who would like to vote for Director Maurer, please raise your virtual hand or text Executive Director Rex. And you're not allowed to see it, and the law is not followed, then you're never going to have the, the confidence that the All right, I will close polling for Director Maurer. Ms. Stevens, please take your screenshots and let me know when you're complete. And um, directors, um, with this, we're, we're gonna have two of these uh, where results will be pending and provided to us later in the meeting. Uh, so if someone would like to craft a motion, 
I would um, I would entertain a virtual hand or a star six so we can move forward with with the motion to accept the uh, the appointees of E470 the the advisory committee on aging and um, the voting results on the regional transportation committee and the state advisory state transportation advisory committee. So, Ms. Stevens, is, is there a virtual hand up um, where a director is willing to create a motion? Uh, yes, we do have a hand raised from uh, Director Aaron Brockett. So, Director Brockett, go ahead. Yes, I'd uh, like to move that we accept by acclamation the appointments to the ACA and E470 committees and accept the results of the voting on the RTC and STAC committees. Thank you very much, Director Brockett. Uh, is there a second? Please raise your virtual hand and press star six. Uh, yes, there is a hand raised from uh, Director Bud Starker. So, Director Starker, go ahead. You I second the motion. Great. Thank you, Director Starker. Uh, Ms. Stevens, um, please open Ms. the phone. It sounds like Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Right. Chairman? Yes. If I may, um, I know Director Binkley, she's having trouble unmuting herself. She she has a comment. Um, Melinda, can you can you unmute Director Bink Director Binkley? Absolutely. Let me there we go. All right, Director Binkley, you should be able to unmute yourself at this time. Hi, can you hear me? We can, yep. yes. Oh, hi everyone, sorry. Um, I couldn't unmute and say this earlier, but I feel like I couldn't accurately vote for anybody without knowing why people wanted to be on these committees and maybe what their views were. So I'm a bit disappointed. Um, I don't know if we can go back and do it. I don't know if everybody else just knows how everybody else will be, but I do not. Um, I'm feeling a bit disenfranchised. That's it. Okay, Director Binkley, thank you very much for your comments. Executive Director Rex, um, can I turn it to you for a response and uh, maybe outline the process? Well, um, I, I well, I really don't know what to say. I mean, I think you know we can <laughs> we can certainly you know provide an opportunity for for the individuals candidates to provide um, you know why they're interested in those 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 uh, committees if that's your desire mr chairman well i, I mean i'm 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 struggling to uh, to look back in time and, and see if we've done anything differently um i, I don't think this this um, this comment has really ever come up um so i'm i'm sure uh, does that make it because it's never come up does that mean it's not valid <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I just don't, I just don't understand. Does everybody else just know everybody or, yeah. um, I just don't. And I don't know if I missed that part of it. Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, Director Atchison, please. Yeah. Let me try to see if I can help you with this also. This is a volunteer position. It's not something that people are nominated. They have to self nominate. So you're looking for volunteers basically. So these people have volunteered their services for these committee options. But to Ms. Binkley's point, yes, we know most of these because we've set at least one or more years with them. So we have a pretty good idea on an individual basis of where they're at, where they stand, and how they support their communities. Uh, this is a pretty open thing. If somebody wanted to uh, put their name in, they had the opportunity. But I don't know that we have any kind of rules around having a requirement that somebody has to present their credentials or where they stand on these volunteer positions. Well, I feel like if there's enough people that there needs to be a vote, I don't know how I would best vote. It just sounds like kind of a popularity contest. I don't know. I mean, I've been on this board for over a year and I don't. I mean, obviously, it's a position a lot of people want, or they wouldn't be doing it. And, um, you know, I'm not going to like keep holding up the meeting, but it seems like a mistake or something that needs to be rectified in the future. Well, I'm sorry, but I I don't agree with you. 
when you're asking for volunteers, you kind of take the volunteers and where you get from. And it's not necessarily a popularity contest, but it's people who are proven that they are willing to put in the time and service. So, uh, D Director Binkley, it, it sounds like we can we can make this better here in the future, and um, I, I would love to reach out to you and, and um, further this discussion. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say anybody who volunteers doesn't deserve it, but there's obviously something that if we have to vote on something, I don't think it's cool to vote on something I know nothing about the people who are doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I understand completely. Um, and I, I, I appreciate your candor and your comments. And um, I apologize for putting you in this situation. Um, we've, we've, I mean, to me, I've, I've been on the board eight years. I, I think we've always done it this way. And it's not to say it's right or, you know, We've been doing it wrong, but you know I think we can make it better. So uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, to have a conversation with you so we can make it better. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I, I think we're at voting. Mr. Chair, I have my hand raised. Oh, uh, Vice Chair Stolzman. Thank you. I just have a, a potential proposal for your consideration. Um, I, I know as one of the candidates who and I'd be willing to just tell a little bit about myself and if um, directors that are listening would like to text message um, Executive Director Rex if they want to change their votes or make a vote if they didn't feel comfortable. I think it'll take Melinda a little bit of time to tally. And so um, like we could set a time limit, like people need to text Doug by 745 or something like that. But I think it's fair to have the candidates give a, a little bit of information about why they put their names in. And I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it seems like something the candidates would probably be willing to do this evening. Um, if that, I, I think it's a reasonable proposal for, for folks who don't know folks. And I think it just might be able to close the gap tonight just so we can um, get everybody on the same page. All right. Well, um, Vice Chair Stolzman, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Well, is that acceptable to you, Mr. Chair? Does that work to have people change their votes and text yeah. direct directs if they want to change their vote or if they want to make a vote if they didn't? Let me, uh, Executive Director Rex and uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I will defer to Doug. <laughs> I should have a motion and a second on the floor already. All right. Yeah, I agree. I think you need to hold to the rules of order that's happening okay. right now. I hear you. Um, thank you, Director Pfeiffer. Um, uh, Vice Chair Stolzman, it, it sounds like we we're going to uh, to move forward with 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 the, the vote. Um, but I, I, I appreciate your offer, and um, let's let's move forward. And next year we'll we'll, we'll do better. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Aye. Abstain? Uh, abstain. Uh, who, who uh, is that Director Brockett? Uh, yeah, that was, I, I liked Ashley's proposal, so I'm, I'm going to abstain. I thought Director Binkley brought up a, a very valid point, so. I'd... Very much. Uh, the motion passes with one abstention, Director Brockett. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I appreciate your uh, uh, your participation, and uh, let's move forward. Uh, the next item, item 10, discussion. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to just wrap a bow on this. So we will, you know, once Melinda gets an opportunity to tally those votes, we will report back later on in the meeting, um, you know, what the results were. So I just wanted to make clear on that. Thank you very much. Uh, next item, item 10, discussion on the Dr. Cog 2021 budget, Ms. Doc. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the time. Um, yeah, so I think what I'll do process, I know that a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but I'm sure there are some that are newer and uh, maybe unfamiliar. So. The way that the Dr. Cog budget is um, is planned out is we actually begin um, sometime in July, uh, early August, with staff drafting the budget, 
And then we present a draft budget in September to the Finance and Budget Committee and give them a chance to look over the numbers, ask questions, and if there are any revisions requested, um, we make them then between that uh, September and October uh, Finance and Budget Committee meeting. And then in the October meeting, we present um, the draft budget as you're seeing it today, and uh, and they vote for your to recommend it for your approval. So now we're in November, and now um, the ball's in your court to go ahead and, and take a look at the budget, ask questions, and um, hopefully um, approve this budget tonight. One other thing I'll just mention before I go over some highlights is this budget is a little bit different this year. So Dr. Cog's plan is to move to the state fiscal year in the summer of 2021. Uh, and the, if you look at the 2020 budget, about 25 million of the $41 million that was budgeted actually runs now on the state fiscal year. And that would be, um, as most of you know, July through June. Dr. Cog's fiscal year right now is January through December. And it's caused some issues um, during audits because we're having so many of our programs overlap. Uh, what's one year in Dr. Cog's budget, uh, we have two contract years overlapping with the state budget. So for those reasons, we've met with our auditors, we've met with um, legal, our legal team and uh, have all decided that it's really a good move for Dr. Cog to move to that state fiscal year in 2021. However, uh, the Articles of Association right now state that we are to bring a full 12 calendar month budget to you. So that's what you're looking at today. Uh, I just want everyone to keep in mind that although you're seeing this budget today, we do plan to first uh, bring that motion to change and to amend the Articles of Association to you all, to the state fiscal year, and then you would see another budget come your way in May. So um, with that being said, I'll just give some highlights of the overall budget and then um, certainly open the floor up for discussion or questions. Um, this year, we're looking at a really healthy budget. Uh, we are looking at an uh, overall increase in revenues from last year of about 18%. So that's accounted for for several different things. Um, a large part of that is our veterans program is growing. And so we're expecting that program to grow by about $1.7 million. Um, our AHC program, Accountable Health Communities uh, program, we're looking at about a $636,000 growth there. And then we also have CARES Act money in here. And for those of you who don't know, the AAA um, received about $5.2 million in CARES Act funding and another 1.5 million in the Family First funding. So in this budget, you're seeing about 120,000 of that, those dollars being credited to our ombudsman program and about $5 million in pass-through funds. So I just think it's important to point out uh, that that's really a large part of our growth and that our AAA uh, division is working very hard to spend down those funds to help the community. State funds, we're looking at an increase of about 1.35 million, and a lot of that is coming from um, HST funds, which is state money, and um, that's human services transportation funds, and that's about $1 million. And then we're seeing state funds for senior services also increase by about $200,000. If you look at our local funds, you might see a decrease there, but that is actually due to the cyclical nature of our uh, DRAP program. And we're in the second year of that cycle. And so typically what happens in two years is the first year um, when we're collecting the majority of the revenues from the partners that participate in that program, you're seeing uh, an overage. And then the next year you see that, uh, you know, we fall short. But overall, that program, after its two-year cycle, um, it is profitable for Dr. Cog. One other thing I'll bring up here is member dues. Uh, you'll notice that member dues are the same as the 2020 budget. Due to the economic uncertainty, we all made the decision that we would keep member dues at 2020 levels and would not impose any increases. So that pretty much wraps up um, our revenue. If you look at our expenditures, they're really pretty much right in line with the growth of the revenue. So for personnel, we're looking to add about five positions 
And those positions we have, um, let's see here, on my notes, we've got three people in the AAA, and then we have one person in uh, transportation planning operations. Actually, um, that person would serve in the traffic program. For contractual costs, you'll see those up quite a bit. A lot of that is due to the veterans program, which I already mentioned growing, the HST program, where a lot of a majority of that money does go out into projects for programs. And then also um, some consulting services in transportation planning operations for both UPWP and some for our traffic program. Our non-personnel costs include different things such as training, technology, rent, uh, business insurance, premiums. So you'll notice too that those are also going up, but again, it's really in line with our total growth of the organization as a whole. Capital outlay, uh, we typically don't have uh, a lot that, that we do categorize there, but this year we do have about $10,000 noted. Uh, in our office right now, our, our AAA, has doors that you can't see through. And we think it might be a safety concern down the road. So we would like to get clear doors, as you know, that we have um, leading into the main office to um, just to provide better safety for the staff back there. So all being said, our ending balance in our general fund looks good. Um, the increase there you see is mainly in investment income that we expect to receive from uh, the investments we make. And so, that's only uh, budgeted right now at about $30,000. Some years that's higher, some years it's been lower. So that's just the average that we typically go with on that. And then finally, you'll just see um, at our, for the pass-through funds, I do think it's important to point out there that we will have federal transit administration dollars this year. This is the first year that we are going to be direct recipients of those dollars. So um, that's exciting, something that um, the Dr. Cog staff has been working really hard on. And then also that increase in the Area Agency on Aging. And again, um, a, a large portion of that is CARES Act funding that we pass on to providers in the community. So with that being said, I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Doc. Um, Directors, if there's any questions on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, um, I will turn the questions over to you, if any. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from uh, Director Atchison. Can you go back to the revenues piece and explain how we zeroed out the service income? Oh, yes, absolutely. So actually what service income has represented over the years is way back when we had, uh, we actually leased the vans for the van pool service. Um, and so we actually discontinued that and, and no longer own those vehicles. But we had a, a large balance in our general fund that we would use some of those funds each year to cover other expenses. And largely it was for um for advertising for dr cog as a whole as the organization and, and our initiatives so what you're seeing there in service income is really over the years um, we've taken less out of that program and and given it back to ourselves which is why it's noted on here as revenue because it's almost as if we're paying ourselves for those um those advertising services so um now that that fund has been spent down to a, a place where we would like to keep it steady there's zero dollars in there because we do not expect to take any of those funds out to pay ourselves back for advertising costs. Also in the expenditures on in-kind services, there's a $200,000 jump in there. Can you give me any idea what that is? That would be match requirements that we pay. So as we spend more money on certain programs, then um, our match requirements are, are going to go up as well. So right. um, there, and that's not on all grants, match requirements only affect a few. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Director Atchison. And at this time, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, with no further questions, I am happy to entertain a motion. 
If uh, you would like to do so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens. All right, thank you. It looks like we have a hand raise from uh, Catherine Whitman. So Director Whitman, go ahead. You'll just need to unmute yourself. I will make the motion to accept the Dr. Cog 2021 budget as presented. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Stevens, do we have a second? Yes, we do from uh, Director Tammy Maurer, Director Maurer. Again, you'll just need to unmute yourself. Um, second. Second. Thank you, Director Maurer. Ms. Stevens, please uh, hold on. Yeah. We can take a vote. Um, okay. And the line should be open for people to vote. Great. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. The next item, item 11, discussion of transportation improvement program COVID-19 impact options. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think it's suitable to say that uh, COVID-19 has obstructed every portion of our lives here in 2020, including even items discussed at Dr. Cog. And until so certainly as Doug said earlier, you know, 2020 just keeps on giving and giving. Um, soon after everything was shutting down earlier this year, uh, staff was also speculating how this would impact local governments and their TIP projects. So earlier this year, uh, staff held discussions with each committee in the board, presenting them with options on what items Dr. Cog can do to assist them, which then turned into discussions with the affected forums over the last few months. The options presented to them in, in, in attempts to remedy any COVID-19 related delays were acceptable and are outlined in the memo. These options will be part of the project delays discussions and report, which will be coming up, which will be coming to you within the second year delay project agenda memo, which is next, in addition to the full report next month. So these options include, number one, a TIP policy project delay extension. So this allows for a TIP variance to extend the time period for project sponsors to initiate their project phases. So for example, if a project experienced a three-month delay due, due to COVID-19, they may be granted a three-month extension to initiate their project phase, so from October 1st, say, to January 1st. The delay would still appear within the project delays report, but due to COVID-19, the delay deadline would, quote-unquote, reset to January 1st. Using this example, if the phase is not initiated by January 1st, and now therefore first year delayed, the sponsor would still have until July 1st before a second year delay um, comes before that project. Um, and to note about this, uh, the, the project delay extension, uh, the staff recommendation is that if any delay extension requests are approved for longer than eight months, the funding year would automatically be reprogrammed in the following fiscal year. Which then brings us into option number two, which is to reprogram federal funds. So this option allows project sponsors to request their Dr. Cog allocated funds be reprogrammed to another year without triggering a project delay penalty. So this option would mainly be used if a local sponsor is having match and or staffing issues. Again, using, a, using an example, uh, if a project had funding in FY20, and it's approved to be moved into FY21, the project phase would also move. The project phase would not be reviewed as part of the FY20 project delay cycle, though it would still be noted within the project delays report, but instead would be moved to the FY21 review cycle. Uh, the third option is to apply to CDOT to use state toll credits and reduce the project scope accordingly. <clears throat> so state toll credits can replace local match, but they do not provide funding to a project. Therefore, the project scope would have to be reduced. Uh, using an example of a $1 million project with a $800,000 in Dr. Cog allocated funds and $200,000 local match, and the sponsor is unable to provide that 
$5,000 in local match for some reason. If state toll credits are applied, the project would need to reduce the project scope by $200,000. <coughs> um, and an offshoot is 3B, which also utilizes toll credits, but the sponsor would backfill the local match with Dr. Cog unallocated waiting list funds to make this scope whole. So continuing with the example just stated, um, $200,000 in Dr. Cog allocated waiting list funds would be used to backfill the reduced scope, which would make the project whole again. And then the $200,000 would be deducted from the appropriate funding available from the appropriate waiting list. Uh, and so just as a quick side note, there is unallocated funding available for Dr. Cog to program, uh, and that process will begin early next year. So now that we you know, recognize what these options are, uh, attachment one contains the projects that sponsors wish Dr. Cog to consider when looking at these project delays as being affected by COVID. Each request will be verified and discussed as we continue through the project delay process, and we will be part of the delay considerations brought to you in the next agenda item for the second year delays, and then again next month within the full report, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's important to point out that these requests in the attachment are not, are not part of your approval this evening, but it just gives you an idea of the request that the individual sponsors make. Uh, so at this time, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to take any questions or comments if anyone has. Um, the action before you this evening is to approve the options available to the TIP projects impacted by COVID. And then again, just as a reminder, um, as in within attachment one, which is the individual project sponsor request, uh, that is not part of the action this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, board members, are there any questions or comments for Mr. Cottrell at this time? If there is, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Going through the list. Of, okay, it looks like we do have a question or from uh, Director Nicholas Williams. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Todd, this is a little off topic, but kind of as we go through this discussion, it's it's made me think. The the toll credits. Now I know no one selected that as an option. And I can certainly understand that, that having to go back and kind of address a lack of a, a match makes it difficult. Are toll credits something we could discuss kind of going forward using as a as a tool? I, I think especially as a lot of us face some some tighter budgets and, and more match constraints on that. It seems like a, a valuable tool. And I know other regions with toll credit availability certainly use that pretty liberally. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I agree. I think it would be something for us to further explore. I mean, especially in the context of COVID-19, where we anticipate, you know, TIP project sponsors are going to continue to have issues uh, especially into FY21 and maybe even further. Um, so yes, Dr. Todd, or none of the TIP sponsors did apply to use, um, or at least indicated they were gonna use the state toll credits. Um, we have actually heard from one that is interested, but I, I don't know what the status is. Um, so I think it's something certainly we'll keep in mind, um, especially as we continue through the delays process and into next year. Thanks. All right, thank you, Director Williams. Uh, and at this time, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, with no further questions or comments, I am happy to entertain a motion. If you're willing to provide a motion, please press star six on your phone or raise your virtual hand. Ms. Stevens, is there anyone out there? All right, I'm just looking through the list for a hand raise. Okay, still not seeing any hands. Okay, we have a hand raised from uh, Director Atchison. Go ahead. Motion is moved, please. Thank you, Director Atchison. Do we have a second? Uh, we do from uh, Director Sally Daigle. No second. Thank you, Director Daigle, with a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Stevens, please open the phone lines so we can vote. All right, we're ready. 
Aye. 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 Item 12, Discussion of Transportation Improvement Program Second Year Delays. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, so before we get uh, deeply involved in this, I just wanted to make sure that we are all looking at the correct information. Um, so Tuesday morning, uh, Melina e Melinda emailed a re revision to this agenda item um, containing an updated memo and attachment. Um, so this discussion will cover the information presented in that revised agenda item. Uh, the adopted 16 to 21 TIP policy, which is the policy that covers the FY20 second year delayed projects, states that project phases that are delayed for a second year are allowed to appeal to the board for a variance to continue if that phase is still delayed and therefore not initiated by October 15th. Um, so you can see in attachment one that outlines this project delay policy. Uh, Dr. Cog's staff has reviewed the status of all the project phases that received a first year delay last year uh, for 2019. And after confirming with CDOT, RTD, RTD and project sponsor staff, it, it has been determined that seven projects continue to be delayed and were not initiated by October 15th. Two of those seven projects have since initiated their projects and therefore are no longer delayed. So as we just discussed in the last agenda item, um, COVID-19 has been a large and unfore unforeseen change to the delays process this year. So a few months ago, Dr. Cog's staff began reaching out to all the TIP sponsors to explain those different options available to them if they believe COVID-19 impacted their projects. The options they choose, that, that the options that they chose, which were just part of the action items that you approved, would be part of the delays, uh, discussions, and recommendations presented here and in the full report, which we'll, you'll see next month. A description of each of these five remaining delays, including the reasons for the delay and the recommendations, are as follows. Each project has requested a variance to continue, as outlined in the remaining attachments. In addition, uh, staff has also recommended a COVID-19 variance on four of the five projects, with one project not submitting any additional variance requests. The table included within the memo provides a good outline, at, outline as to the recommendations. So to the first project, uh, which is the Islip Avenue operational improvement from Parker Road to, to uh, Quebec. Uh, this is sponsored by Arapahoe County. So the primary reasons for the delay include, include right-of-way acquisition, utility clearance, and construction phase planning. Delays related specifically to COVID-19 include consultant impact, meeting with project owner, property owners, in-person to virtual meeting, and the city of Aurora opting out of this project. So the project phase that is delayed for the second year is construction, meaning that the project would have to advertise for construction to not be delayed any longer. Uh, the county anticipates advertising this coming January before the 120-day 120 120 day deadline, but due to numerous COVID-19 delays, uh, Dr. Cox staff is also, also recommending an additional two-month variance. The second project uh, is by the city and county of Denver, ITS device performance and reliability improvements. So Denver states that this project didn't necessarily specifically encounter any major delays, but certainly COVID-19 slowed down the entire process. Uh, the project phase that is delayed for a second year is procurement, meaning the project would have needed to release an RFP to not be delayed any longer. Denver anticipates release, releasing this RFP at the end of this month before the 120-day deadline. The third project um, by Douglas County is the C-470 multi-use trail grade separation at Yosemite. So the primary reason for the delay includes not being able to connect with one property owner uh, for right-of-way acquisition after multiple attempts, even going back to uh, early this February. The county recently started the condemnation process to attain this property. The project phase that is delayed for a second year is construction, meaning they'd have to reach advertisement to not be delayed any longer. Um, 
the county anticipates advertising by the end of next July, soon long after the 120-day deadline. However, due to communications that indicate the property owner has ignored and shifted their priorities during COVID, um, and the county is doing everything in its power to contact and, and is acting in good faith, Dr. Cog's staff is also recommending an additional six-month variance. Uh, the fourth project is also a project with Douglas County for US 85 from Highlands Ranch Parkway to County Line Road, and these are capacity improvements. So the primary reasons for this delay include major utility company staff reductions due to COVID, which caused a, at least a six month delay in work stoppage, an unexpected major water line realignment, a delayed right away acquisition from one owner, um, the lack of an IGA, though they are working through this uh, currently, and finally bridge redesigns that, re that were required by CDOT. Um, the project phase that is delayed is construction, meaning as mentioned earlier, um, they would need to advertise the project to not be delayed. Um, at this time, the county anticipates advertising by the end of next June. Um, again, this is after the 120, dead 120 day deadline, but, but due to numerous COVID-19 delays, um, especially concentrating on the utility company delays, um, Dr. Cog's staff is also recommending an additional nine month variance. Uh, and finally, the last project uh, by Wheat Ridge is the Wad Wadsworth widening from 35th to 48th. So the primary reasons for this delay include a previous environmental delay, uh, the revisit of historical properties, um, the added difficulty of reviewing very large plan sets virtually versus being able to print them out under normal office conditions. Uh, so the project phase that has delayed is construction, uh, meaning they'd have to advertise the project um, to not be delayed any longer. At this time, Wheat Ridge is anticipating to advertise this February, uh, mm -hmm. which of course is after the 120 day deadline, but due to COVID-19 delays um, regarding the plan set, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Cox staff is recommending an additional two-month variance. Uh, so the adopted TIP policy outlines two options for the board to consider for each of these projects. Uh, first, uh, you could uh, deny the appeal and any amount of federal funds on the delayed project phase not spent would be returned back to Dr. Cox for eventual reprogramming. The other option is to allow a variance of up, up to 120 days from October 1st. Um, so this would put us at January 29th of next year. Uh, if that deadline is not met by the sponsors, all federal funds for the delayed phase would be returned to Dr. Cog for eventual reprogramming. Uh, but however, you know, new for this year, especially due to COVID, and as an exception to the TIP policy, uh, Dr. Cox staff is requesting the board consider a second variance for COVID-19 for each of the appropriate projects. Each individual request is made as part of the recommendations within the memo and varies on the project. Overall, the Dr. Cox staff recommendation is to approve a 120-day variance for each project from October 1st, in addition to each COVID-19 variance as indicated in the memo to allow them to continue. So at this time, I'll turn this back over to the chair to see if there are any board member comments on any of the project delays or recommendations. And certainly if there are any questions, representatives from each of the project sponsors, whether this be a board member or staff are available to take those questions. Um, afterwards, and again, it's outlined in the memo, the action before you tonight is to approve the staff recommendation for each project to allow the sponsors project to, to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Cottrell. Board members, uh, are you? Uh, are there any questions out there? I, I, again, if there's uh, framework questions, Mr. Cottrell will be more than happy to to address. If you have project specific, we we do have representatives from the municipalities uh, standing by. So uh, with that, any questions or comments, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from Director Atchison. Mr. Chair, I don't have a question. I do have a, a piece. There is not a city or a county in the Dr. Cog region that isn't having to face 
the decisions on delays, financing, because of not only COVID, but the downturn in the economy, partly because of COVID. And I think every, every opportunity for these projects to stay intact is gonna be beneficial to those municipalities. And I would hate for us to not support our neighbors where they have been impacted. Uh, some of these I'm well aware of is trying to get landowners to agree to IGAs to get uh, various federal and state departments to get these IGAs done when we have so many people not working in their normal offices. And especially trying to review large sets of prints on a computer is almost impossible to do. I would like to go ahead and make a recommendation to follow the staff recommendation on these delays and allow them as defined by the staff agenda memorandum. So we, we have a motion. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody with their hands raised? Uh, yes, it looks like uh, from uh, Director Karina Elrod. You can unmute yourself now. I'll second. Thank you, Director Elrod. With a motion and a second, Ms. Stevens, can you open the phone line so we can vote, please? All right, lines are open. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, Ms. Stevens, you can uh, mute the lines and we will move on to the next the next item, uh, item 13, discussion of fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jacob Rieger with Dr. Cog's staff. Give me just a second to get my presentation up on the screen sharing. Okay, there we go. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, again, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Uh, we're going to talk this evening about um, what we call fiscally constrained recommended project and program investment priorities for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so uh, we've covered this um, at the board work session back in early November. Um, really not a lot of new information here. I recognize not everyone was able to attend the board work session. Um, so I'm gonna hit the high points of this. Um, first, starting out, just kind of talking about our kind of planning framework for the 2050 uh, regional transportation plan process. One of the most important things that the regional transportation plan does is it helps implement Dr. Cog's MetroVision plan. Um, as you see on the screen, that was actually so important to our transportation advisory committee uh, when they unanimously recommended approval. Um, of what you're considering tonight. Um, as you'll see in the motion at the end of my presentation, they actually put in their motion a link to, um, a link to the MetroVision plan uh, to emphasize that relationship. Um, in our 2050 planning process, um, focusing on the regional policy priorities um, that you see here, and really striking a balance um, between, you know, we're a very diverse region, so striking that balance between sort of local context and uh, regional priorities. Um, and that was that was an important uh, framework in our planning process. It's something we also heard from our uh, regional evaluation panel as we went through this work. Um, we have some explicit programmatic investments um, addressing some of these regional policy priorities, emphasis on multimodal projects, um, significant public and stakeholder engagement. And we've piloted a couple, um, at least a couple things that we're doing this time that we haven't done before um, in a planning process. Um, and then regional collaboration for the region's transportation plan. And that's regional collaboration, both with um, all of you uh, local governments through our county transportation forums, as well as the big three regional agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. I do wanna take this moment um, to thank as part of this board meeting, all of the local government staff, your staff, um, that's participated in this planning work to get us to this point, uh, particularly over the summer. 
Um, there was just a, a tremendous amount of work to be done in a very short amount of time. Um, and everyone across the region really worked together collaboratively with us to do that. And we're very appreciative. Um, so we've gone over this before as well, so I'm not going to do this point by point, but basically just some federal requirements that um, talk about the need to individually identify major capacity projects and to show those projects in the plan by what we call air quality uh, staging period as part of our air quality conformity modeling. And to demonstrate that through this plan, uh, collectively, we have the revenues to support the projects and expenditures that we're proposing as part of this plan. You've also seen this slide before. This is our framework in terms of the framework we use for our planning process. Uh, really, a couple of points here is, again, when you take all of the great work that's been done, not just at Dr. Cog, uh, but our partner agencies and our local government agencies, as well as some state and federal things, put those all together. That really is our framework for this planning process. I would note in particular House Bill 1261. Um, you've received recent presentations on House Bill 1261, which is the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Bill. Um, it's been front and center in the work that we've been doing. Um, really, even when we started our planning process before House Bill 1261, greenhouse gas emissions are uh, a foundational uh, objective and measure and target within the Metro Vision Plan. Um, but certainly with House Bill 1261 uh, front and center in, in the work that we've been doing to get to this point. Um, so when we talk about, you know, this sort of, this is the federal term of fiscal constraint, really meaning cost affordability or cost feasibility within the plan. There's a lot of ways that that's shown overall in the financial plan for the regional transportation plan. Um, really tonight, the focus is on uh, what we call the regionally funded projects, meaning the projects that uh, would be funded through uh, revenues over time uh, from the big three agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, um, as well as the programmatic investments also coming uh, from those revenues. Um, so that priority investment program strategy that we've um, talked about at a previous meeting, um, again, I won't go through it point by point, um, but the notion here is that, again, given some of those local and regional policy priorities, things that are top of mind for all of us around air quality conformity, greenhouse gas emissions, safety, vision zero, some of the other things that you see listed here, we wanted to intentionally show some allocation of dollars within, uh, within the 2050 regional transportation plan towards uh, these programmatic policy investments over time. Some projects we're proposing up front as part of our project list for the 2050 plan. Um, again, this is a 30-year plan, so many of these projects will be um, identified over time, um, but it's to have that framework of, of showing these dollars towards these types of investments uh, through the planning period. Um, in terms of the project and program investments, um, another thing that has been a foundation through our planning process is as much as we can um, to have geographic equity. Again, this isn't a budget document, it's not the tip. Um, it is a 30 year long range plan with a lot of different types of projects in it. Um, but we at least wanted to, as, as best we could, um, you know, honor and respect uh, local forum, transportation forum, county forum priorities, and have some geographic equity across the region. This table that you're seeing does include both the projects and the program investments. Um, it includes the funding from the three regional agencies. It also includes some of the carryover projects from the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. And I will say in particular, both in the carryover projects, as well as a few of the projects that we're proposing for the 2050 plan, there are some big expensive projects um, that I think will serve the entire region, but given where they're located, we tried to account for that in this table, but there's a few projects that can really um, sort of influence these numbers. And on those same lines, several projects also um, cross uh, or span uh, multiple counties. One other point that I wanted to make here is that as part of our analysis on fiscal constraint, you know, as I said, we're taking together all of these sort of federal, you know, state, local revenues and expenditures, everything that goes into uh, maintaining and updating our regional transportation system. But as part of this exercise to reach fiscal constraint, um, we are assuming some regional revenue assumption um, to help us, you know, get to that fiscal constraint number. And really what that means is that Again, this is a 30-year plan, you know, not a specific type of dollar or source of dollar over time, but the idea that, you know, over the next 30 years, will this region find a way to contribute um, through some methods and dollars um, towards some major investments in, in this region over time. Um, so we are assuming uh, about $800 million from a regional funding source um, as part of our fiscal constraint calculations. And that really helps us, frankly, get more projects, good projects in the plan. 
Um, also wanted to show sort of the project type. This is a little bit counterintuitive because one of our whole points here is that we're, you know, wanting to find these projects that can do multiple things. Um, you know, projects that are multimodal in nature, you know, a transit project might be a safety project, a roadway project maybe has some multimodal elements to it. Um, but that said, we wanted to show you the breakdown at a, at a broad level of the types of projects in this plan. Um, again, you see the influence of those carryover projects uh, from the 2040 plan. Um, but I will say, having done this at Dr. Cog for almost a decade, this is the most diverse set of um, projects, candidate projects that we received in this process. And I think it's a really good set of multimodal projects that, again, you know, respects local priorities, um, but also helps us achieve some things at the regional level. Um, staging periods relate to air quality conformity. This is the notion that, as I said earlier, we need to stage these projects across 10-year and five-year uh, staging periods through the 30 years of the plan um, to help us do our air quality conformity analysis. We also have a federal requirement that our um, projects and our revenues and our expenditures are also staged reasonably throughout the life of the plan so that not everything is, say, within the first 10 years of the plan, uh, but that we've got some level of, of reasonable distribution. Um, just to be transparent with the board, uh, the final bullet here, based on final fiscal constraint status, we are asking for some very limited discretion to work with project sponsors uh, to adjust project staging as needed. You'll see an example of that in just a moment. Um, the plan also includes locally funded projects. Um, these is working with local governments, local project sponsors, um, updating these projects from the 2040 plan, um, as well as working with our toll highway authorities uh, on their projects as well. Again, to be transparent with you, we are asking for some limited discretion to finalize uh, locally funded projects based on uh, the decision that you're hopefully about to make in terms of these regionally funded uh, projects for the fiscally constrained plan. Um, the schedule, um, again, you've seen this before, and we're actually through uh, what's shown here. We're actually through about halfway or close to two-thirds of the schedule. Really, what's driving our schedule is a federal deadline, um, an unchangeable federal deadline that says that the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration need to review and certify the adopted 2050 plan by June 27, 2021. Um, so the schedule is really driven by the need to meet that deadline. Um, so with hopefully your board action tonight, uh, we will transition to the very next phase of this project, which is to conduct uh, the, the air quality conformity analysis um, on the list of projects that you approve uh, for the plan, and then actually start putting the plan document together for public and stakeholder review in early 2021. Um, finally, I wanted to, uh, for transparency, provide some clarification on one project that's in the proposed, um, <clears throat> in the recommended fiscally constrained project list. Um, this is the Pena project, um, Pena between I-70 and E-470. Um, we have worked collaboratively with our partners at the city of Denver um, and Denver International Airport to just put a little bit more definition um, on this project. So as you see on the screen, based on that partnership, uh, we're proposing that the project would be adding one new managed lane in each direction, again, between I-70 and E-470, um, and including the project in the 2030 to 2039 air quality staging period. Um, the, t the total project cost does not change, but the Dr. Cog sort of portion of that decreases slightly. And then again, in order to maintain fiscal constraint by staging period that I talked about earlier, we did need to move four projects that you see listed here um, back one staging period. Uh, we got concurrence from each of those project sponsors uh, to do that. And so with that one change, the motion before you is we're asking you to approve the fiscally constrained uh, project and program investment priorities with the one amendment I just discussed, um, recognizing Metro Vision plan primary objectives were considered in developing these recommendations. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. Um, board members, if there are any questions or comments uh, at this time, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, uh, are there any questions or comments for Mr. Rieger? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we have a few. Uh, the first question or comment is from Director Rocket. You may unmute yourself now. Jacob, thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, appreciate that very much. It looks like a, a phenomenal plan overall. 
And um, so I'll just raise something that I raised at the work session, if you don't mind, since we're at the decision point uh, tonight. So if you just don't mind bringing it up again, it, it's the question about how the state greenhouse gas reduction roadmap rulemaking would play into the plan, right? Because they're finishing that, you know, sometime within the next year. And so how would that get incorporated into that plan? Because the transportation obviously is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state and our future project lists will have a significant impact on the future of greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado. So how will that play into the evolution of this plan um, in the next few years? And is, is, is that planned in already or is there something that we can recommend to move that forward? If you could address that, please. Yeah, thank you, Director Brockett. So a couple of things on that. Um, one is, again, even before House Bill 1261, the whole concept of and the importance of air quality conformity, uh, greenhouse gas emissions was a foundational principle in developing the 2050 plan and getting us to this point. I hope that's reflected in the project list, you know, very multimodal uh, project list. It really takes that, um, takes that concept to heart. Um, that concept along with the concept of safety and some of the other policy priorities that I covered. Um, so definitely with House Bill 1261, you know, the foundation of that has been part of our planning process. Um, as you as you acknowledge in your question, we don't yet have sort of the quantitative um, target guidance just yet. Um, but when that does come, when the rulemaking is complete and we have some more definition around that, we also will have the opportunity to amend this plan. And I would make the point that, you know, a 30-year plan, a long-range plan is a snapshot in time. It's a plan that we update every four years and amend, you know, more frequently in between. Um, so whether it's House Bill 1261, you know, whether it's Reimagine RTD or some of the other efforts going on around our region, you know, we do the very best that we can at, at this point in time, uh, recognizing that over time, you know, there are those opportunities to continually refine and amend the plan uh, to bring those things even more into play. Yeah, thank you for that. And just is, is there anything written into the plan itself about how we might, you know, relook at it as we get those quantitative measures in there? Um, so we are actually starting to draft the plan document now. Um, but yes, there will be, um, there, that content will be in the plan and that relationship um, to House Bill 1261 will be in the plan for sure. Great, that's that's very good to hear. And so if you don't mind, uh, one more question. I, so I understand that the the uh, Dr. Cog is working on a, um, a complete streets toolkit in, that's also planned on coming out next year. And would there be any way once that's complete to kind of include that in sort of guidance that's given to municipalities and different jurisdictions as they're uh, developing kind of the specific uh, construction plans for these projects? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Director Brockett. So um, you're right about that. We recently initiated a project that we're calling a Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. And without getting too much into that project, just the summary of that is that the, the idea is to uh, provide a toolkit, provide some guidance to local jurisdictions uh, when it comes to time that they have a, you know, maybe some tools and a better sense of, of what we might be looking for in terms of how specific projects are uh, are designed and implemented for when they're defining those projects at tip time. We purposely structured the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit project to actually do um, a piece that normally we would do later. We're actually doing it up front so that we can get that into the 2050 plan now. Um, and that piece is what we call the street typologies, uh, which is basically the classification of you know, kind of the different streets and roadways in our region um, and sort of that aspirational kind of, you know, what are they, what, what could they be over time um, to actually provide that typology as part of the 2050 plan document um, to, again, you know, going back to that idea of setting that framework in the long range plan um, to provide that direction in future tip cycles. That's, uh, I'm really glad to hear that. And will that be, as you kind of produce the very final plan with all the language and such, will that be included in that that language as kind of going forward for the final version? Yes, sir, it will. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Jacob. That's all I have. All right, thank you for your question, Director Brockett. Our next question or comment is from Director Elise Jones. Thanks. Um, Jacob, I, I too want to thank you for the presentation and uh, express appreciation to all the staff work that went into putting together this plan and the work with the sub-region forums and um, 
and uh, want to applaud how uh, what a multimodal list it is as well. I also wanted to follow up on Director Brockett's comments about the greenhouse gas um, uh, roadmap and the relationship of the plan to that. Um, I guess speaking with two hats on, one is a local elected official who just um, experienced, uh, you know, a month ago, the um, largest wildfire we've ever had in our county's history and our, had to put in to our upcoming budget a million and a half dollars uh, for our contributions for, for fighting that fire that was exacerbated by um, climate change. So that's all fresh in my mind. And also wearing the hat as an air quality control commission member, um, the rulemaking that uh, the transportation uh, rulemaking related to the greenhouse gas roadmap will be next summer. And so I think as was pointed out in prior conversations, the timing between this plan and, and that rulemaking is a little off. So I am happy to hear that you're planning on including mention in the plan document of, of the roadmap and the need to sort of um, look at uh, changes to the plan to make sure it's in alignment with meeting the the state targets. And so I think I heard you say that you were gonna include mention of that. And I guess I think it would be helpful to be explicit in setting the expectation that we will need to update this plan pretty shortly after we get that that greenhouse um, gas roadmap rulemaking in place um, to make sure that it aligns with, with those state targets. I always think it's helpful if people know that that's coming down the pike. So if I heard you correctly, I, I'm in total agreement with that and appreciate that inclusion. Thank you, Director Jones. You did hear me correctly. All right, thank you, Director Jones. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Director Karina Elrod. You'll just need to, oh, there you go. Yep, there I am. Um, so thank you as well for this um, comprehensive um, uh, presentation of where we're heading in 2050. Um, always so hard to plan that much into the future, now more than ever, even harder. Um, a question regarding the carry forward, the 26%, about 26%, I think is what I caught on the carry forward. Is that something that is typical? Do we normally see about a quarter of the um, um, funds essentially um, being carryover projects? Is that typical? Um, you know, that's a good question, Director. Um, it is typical that we, you know, when we move from the old plan to the new plan, we will have several carryover projects. Um, so that, that concept is pretty typical. I will confess, I don't know if it's always about 26% or always about a fourth of um, kind of the projects. I will say, my guess is that it's probably a little bit higher this time. Again, you know, we've got a couple major projects, for example, the I-25 Gap project, um, the Central 70 project. Um, you know, there's just a couple of projects, both in the 2040 carryover, and as I said, as part of the 2050 plan, just some really massive projects that I think can throw these numbers a little bit. Um, but we wanted to show that to kind of acknowledge that a piece of this is, you know, are those projects coming over from 2040? Okay, perfect. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director. It looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Director Sally Daigle. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Actually, no, I don't have a comment. It was already answered. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. And with that, uh, I do not see any additional hands raised at this time. So I will. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, board members, with no further comments or questions, I'm happy to entertain a motion. If you'd like to provide a motion, um, please feel free to raise, raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have a, uh, a hand for a motion, please? Yes, it looks like our first hand raise was from Director Ashley Stolzman. All right, you should be unmuted mm -hmm. and can make them Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I move that the board approves the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan with an acknowledgement that the board wants to revisit it to amend it once we have the GHG standards and analysis available. We have a motion. Do we have a second? 
Uh, yes, we do. It looks like we have a hand raised from Director Wynn Shaw. You can unmute yourself and second. I second this motion. Thank you Mr. very much. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Stevens, can you please? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Mr. Papstorf. Thank you, uh, Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Um, did want to ask uh, the uh, maker of the motion and the seconder if they would um, object to using the requested motion language, which was the motion that was passed by the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday morning. As you, um, as you know, under our MPO structure, Metropolitan Planning Organization structure, the board and RTC are required to adopt um, the same motion for um, these to be effective. Um, I, we, we definitely heard the point about greenhouse gas emissions and we will we will have that in the record and we'll 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 take that forward as we fully develop the plan but um would appreciate not having to delay this action and take it back through the regional transportation committee yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Director Stoltzman. Yeah, I I didn't um, intend to upset the apple cart and make it have to go back to RTC and don't up, oppose the um, requested motion to con to be consistent with RTC. I just want to make it clear to staff what the conversation was tonight, that we, we had consensus from the discussion that we would revisit this once we have more information from the study. And that's what I heard through the discussion. And I just wanted to make the motion clear about that but if staff's clear that that's our intent and direction then you know i'm happy to accept the motion as presented on the slide here move to approve the 2050 mbrtp fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities as amended recognizing the metro visions uh primary objectives were considered in developing these recommendations right uh director I would second. okay yes thank you very much director show um, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Stevens, uh, please open the phone lines so we can vote. All right, the line. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your, your comments and votes. Uh, the next item uh committee reports uh first report is report from the state transportation advisory committee director jones please all right um i think i mentioned that the transportation commission would be bringing uh considering the rpp formula um after a long um wait on consideration for that and they did and they approved it um, we got an update from CDOT Director Liu on the governor's budget, which you probably heard includes some econo economic stimulus funding, including about, I think, $130 million for shovel-ready transportation projects, which will include some repair of some Denver area bridges and the Eisenhower Tunnel, as well as um, $50, $70 million to expand the Safer Main Streets program statewide. Um, we voted on revisions to the stack bylaws. Uh, Vince Rokowski was reelected for the umpteenth time as chair, and Heather mm -hmm. Sloop from Northwest Colorado became vice chair. And perhaps most importantly, um, we got an update on proposed changes to the 1601 interchange process, which is the process by which um, CDOT reviews and approves requests to, for new interchanges on state, the state and federal highway system. And the, the biggest change of the policy is that it's gonna establish a new transportation demand management requirement for major interchange requests, which will um, require the applicant to, to um, adopt and use TDM strategies to reduce interchange ramp traffic. And uh, Dr. Cog staff were consulted in the process and, and are comfortable that this is gonna be a workable approach. And then last but not, leave, uh, last but not least, uh, we got an update on the scenic and historic byways program. I didn't realize that Colorado has more byways than any other state in the US, um, but apparently we're in hot competition with Oregon. So that's it from Stack. Thank you very much, Director Jones. Uh, next report of the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director, Director Atchison, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Metro Mayor's Caucus will be meeting tomorrow. And at that meeting, it will be attended by the new 
CEO and direct, uh, executive director of RTD, Deborah Johnson, as well as the chairs of the House and Senate Transportation Committees. Thank you very much, Director Atchison. Uh, the next report, re report uh, from Metro Area County Commissioners. I've been informed uh, there is no report by Director Partridge. Uh, next, uh, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. sanchez Warren, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is one of those weird months where the Aging Advisory Committee is held on Friday, and it's going to be all about transportation. So I will be happy to tell you what happened next month. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, report from Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had a number of items. One was the draft 2021 budget and work program discussion. The, the work program and budget will come to for a vote at the uh, December meeting. Uh, there was a uh, presentation on the serious area ozone plan uh, on the on the RAC pre-hearing statement. The AQCC hearing for the for the serious non-attainment is occurring in um, uh, middle of December, December 17th and 18th. And uh, they provided us with some background information on their pre-hearing statement. The, that pre-hearing statement will be revised between now and when it's due. Um, we are working with RAC ourselves um, uh, to, uh, to, to have a consistent message as we go forth on that. Um, there was a 2020 summer ozone season um, review. Uh, as I think most of you know, and I've stated here multiple times, it wasn't the best of years for ozone. Um, we're hoping for, for better in 2021, for sure. And we also had a, a review of uh, the, uh, the uh, public education program, Simple Steps Better Air, for the 2020 season. And um, it was, uh, I, I thought staff at RAC did a tremendous job this year on the program. And um, last but not least, we had an, uh, a, an update from, from ICLEI on the greenhouse gas emissions inventory that they, they prepared over the past year. Um, there were some very interesting information in there about the Dr. Cog region, and we're hoping to get a similar presentation to the board in some capacity over the next couple of months. Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you very much. Uh, the next report, report from E470 Authority, I will, uh, I will take. Uh, we, had a, uh, we had a board meeting which uh, we addressed the Aurora Parkway intergovernmental agreement with City of Aurora. Uh, there's going to be an overpass uh, or parkway over E470 uh, you know, in, in South Arapahoe County. Uh, we also uh, approved a task order that allows uh, E470 to integrate with the I-70 express lanes. Uh, we also had a future projects uh, discussion um, of note uh, from 2021 to 2025, um, E470 is projecting roughly $332 million of construction projects. Uh, from I-70 to 104th is, is the largest construction project with two new interchanges and four uh, interchanges that work will be uh, needed to be put on. Um, and then looking forward, 2026 to 2030, uh, E-470 is projecting $262 million of uh, further construction improvements. Uh, widening of 104th to I-76, and then uh, coming back down to I-25 to Parker Road. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes my report. Uh, report from CDOT, uh, Director White. Uh, good evening, everyone. Well, I'm um, happy tonight to not have to uh, talk about wildfires, um, although there was a, a brief moment there at the beginning of the month when the CDOT team was both dealing with wildfires and snow at the same time. Um, a moment that we called a uh, fire and ice. <laughs> uh, so now we've moved, I think, solidly into the ice and snow um, part of our work, which is a, a great relief for everyone. Um, Director Jones mentioned, I think, one of the most um, important issues we're tracking on at CDOT, and that is uh, the governor's budget and specifically the proposal for $200 million in stimulus dollars for transportation that would go towards the, the two major priorities. Director Jones mentioned uh, 130 million for shovel-ready projects around the state, um, as well as about 70 million to advance work on uh, increasing safety on arterials around the state and um, some COVID-related work um, to revitalize main streets and open up 
street spaces where we can to restaurants um, and to uh, bicyclists and, and pedestrians so that we they can better space out during the COVID period. Uh, so we're uh, anxious to see that proposal move forward. Other than that, tonight I'll just um, close with a couple of thank yous. Um, I'm anxious to hear who our new representatives at Stack will be and look forward to working with those members, but want to, to um, give my appreciation to Director Jones and Director Partridge for their tenure on Stack. Uh, very important group to CDOT and having Dr. Cog's voice on that um, is just tremendous. So appreciate the the many, many meetings uh, they devoted to that group. And also uh, I wanted to thank Ron Pepsdorf and Jacob Rieger for the partnership with CDOT on developing the 2050 plan. Really appreciate the good discussions uh, we were able to have together in developing that. And that's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, report on Fast Tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the RTD Fast Tracks Committee meets every Fast Tracks or Planning Capital Programs Fast Tracks Committee, as I've informed the this board before, meets every other month. Their next meeting is in December. But a couple quick hits about RTD. One, oh, our right. new general manager, Deborah Johnson, started on <coughs> last week on Monday, November 9th. She's rapidly getting up to speed and making the rounds. And I'd like to note that she was able to attend her first Dr. Cog RTC meeting yesterday morning. Um, the Last night, the RTD Board of Directors also approved our budget for the year 2021. The financial challenges faced by RTD are many just as they are for most state and local governments, as we've discussed throughout um, this evening's meeting. And for RTD, depressed sales tax revenues coupled with drops in ridership and fare box revenues. So incorporated in the budget for 2021 is a continuation of the COVID service levels at about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. A reduction in force or layoffs scheduled to occur in early 2020, early January 2021, of approximately 400 employees, furloughs, salary reductions for higher paid staff, and restrictions and cuts to overhead. Details are available on our website. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't note that the RTD Accountability Committee supported by Dr. Cog's staff, hosted by Dr. Cog, continues to meet regularly and is making a lot of progress considering multiple multiple topics and recommendations related to governance, operations, and finance. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Director Van Meter. Uh, the next uh, section of the agenda, informational items, item 15, transportation improvement program administrative modifications. That is there for you to review at your leisure. Uh, next section, administrative items. Uh, item 16, next meeting is December 16th, 2020. Item 17, other matters by members. Um, but before I get to that, I'm, I'm being messaged that uh, we do not have uh, results just yet, but we will need to uh, address that here after this meeting. So uh, we will be in suspense. Uh, item 17, other matters by members. Uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, it, are there any other matters by members? Please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six. Mr. Chairman. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, sir, very much. Now, I just wanted to, to just to, uh, expand on, on your statement you just made about the vote. Yeah, we, we um, Melinda's still tallying those votes. <laughs> Got a little more complicated than probably. We, we figured it would but so what we're planning on doing it requires an action anyway so we'll just provide it in a memo at the in that next month's meeting and um and we'll go from there thank you thank Chair you. um yes this is bill bill gibb from erie I was, I was hoping to make a quick comment uh director gibb please thank you and uh and i don't want to belabor the point uh just going back to the the committee vote um i was having trouble with my mute at the time during the vote and so I, I want to reiterate that I, I do support uh, the concerns that Director Binkley had um, during during normal times. Yeah, we we do have a lot more interaction, and so it is a little different. Um, and I did feel I had enough personal knowledge of those people myself. But uh, definitely for COVID times, I think we need to be adjusting to the the lack of interaction that we actually get to have with each other. Um, and so I did like Director Stolzman's proposal, willingness to speak, 
And uh, although Director Brock had abstained, I probably would have said a no vote because I would have wanted a little more discussion before we voted, believing that if we all, enough of us voted no, we could carry it on to the next meeting. Uh, and, and although there was a first and second on the table. So I'm a little disappointed in the lack of creativity on the fly and uh, the lack of talking about potential alternatives and ways around that. Um, but for the record, I, I am a no vote on that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gibb. Ms. Stevens, anybody else? Chair Dyack, Jim Dale. Um, Director Dale, please. Uh, I'm pleased to note that uh, former Mayor Marjorie Sloan from Golden was elected to the RTD board, and I think that that will be a wonderful addition. And I'm very positive about it. Thank you, Director Dale. Uh, uh, Director Sloan, she was uh, she was a Dr. Cog uh, alumni, and we uh, congratulate her and wish her wish her the best on her on her continued uh, service. Director Stevens? Dyack, this is Sally Daigle. Uh, Director Daigle, please. I I have a question for Mr. Van Meter about um, the the vote and the layoffs that are um, coming in January. I know that um, Governor Polis had asked for the layoffs to be delayed, but the um, that they their uh, budget only uh, went through the end of the years with the CARES Act. Is there a possibility that RTD could apply for CARES Act money in January? and then delay some of those layoffs? Chair, this is um, Bill Van Meter, may I respond? Uh, Director Van Meter, the floor is yours. So yeah, thanks for the question. So to clarify, yeah, the board did approve the budget last night for 2021 that in, uh, essentially incorporates the plan for those um, layoffs scheduled in early January, as I stated. So the CARES mm -hmm. Act funding allocation that was made to RTD um, early this year, early in the COVID crisis, has been substantially spent by RTD to date, um, and it will be completely expended, those funds, the allocation to RTD by the end of this year. Um, th there's more detail than I can go into here, but a key piece of those expenditures was keeping our workforce more or less intact for this calendar year through 2020. Um, absent addition, additional or new funding through either a CARES Act II or a uh, passage of the House's HEROES Act or some other act that allocates new funding to RTD, again, those those CARES Act funds that were allocated to RTD have been substantially spent. There is detail on that as part of the record for the RTD Accountability Committee on RTD's website and, um, and, and how those expenditures were made. So our general manager last night in response to a similar um, question and discussion from our board of directors indicated that if uh, a CARES Act II or some new funding, so federal funding source for transit agencies in general, RTD in specific, is, is passed at the federal level, we have the capability to rescind our planned layoffs. And I expect that our board and management would be in the position where they would recommend that if that were to come okay. true. But we can't count on that and we need to plan um, for our uh, current fiscal reality. Thank you. Thank Chairman you. Uh Director Jones, please. Yeah, I don't mean to lengthen the meeting, but I too feel compelled to say that I'm in agreement with um, doc, uh, Director Gibbs and Director Brockett's comments in um, support of the issues that Director Binkley brought up about our, our voting process today. I think it's another casualty of COVID that these remote phone calls don't allow us to 
uh, get to know each other and, and work together in the normal collaborative fashion that we're used to. And at a minimum, I think going forward in future years, um, Director Stolzman's idea of having the, the candidates speak as to why they want to uh, run for a particular volunteer for a particular uh, committee would be helpful, probably a process improvement even when we're past COVID. Uh, th thank you very much, Director Jones. Um, I, um, I've heard the comments and I will get with Executive Director Rex and the Executive Committee and uh, we will discuss this matter and uh, get better. So. Thank you. You bet. Um, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else who has a um, virtual hand up? I do not see any other hands raised. Ah, great. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Um, with, uh, with no further matters before uh, the board, uh, I will adjourn at 8.36 p.m. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Good night, Chair. Everyone. Good night. Happy Good Thanksgiving. Night, everyone. Happy Thank Thanksgiving, you. everyone. Happy Good Thanksgiving. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.